This episode of the Business of Agriculture is brought to you by Nori. Feeling left out of carbon markets? Nori is a carbon removal marketplace that welcomes early adopters of regenerative farming. We work directly with farmers to enter their data and project their carbon credits, which the farmer owns and sets the price on. Nori is the marketplace, not the middleman, so farmers get paid directly once their credits are sold. We believe that carbon credits should be an asset the farmer controls, not the rights that they sell. To learn more on how you can enroll your farm, visit nori.com growers. And if you are a company looking to get involved with carbon markets, reach out to hello at nori.com. Nori, a carbon marketplace for early adopters. Visit nori.com growers. Well, greetings and welcome to another fantastic episode of the Business of Agriculture. Got a great show for you today because we're talking about a topic that is relevant, pertinent. And frankly, the information is going to come from a guy that I really have grown to like. He's got awesome stuff. He's Pete Meyer. He is with S&P Global Commodity Insights. We're talking about biofuel, the future of biofuel. You know, this came about in the old days as a kid in Indiana. I remember hearing about gaso hall. Uh, it was the whole very first run into this ethanol thing. I think it was the 1970s, probably the 1980s. It was a new idea. We could use this copious amounts of corn that we had, which we were in a surplus situation. In fact, we were in a overly surplus situation back then. And then that was the first run of this. Then we invented ethanol. Um, it seems like about early 2000s when it really started getting a lot of horsepower behind it. Then the renewable fuel standard came into being in about 2004, 2005. So what's the future of ethanol? Well, I've had the CEO of the ethanol group on this podcast twice before, so you can look back to that episode. But what about this other thing called renewable diesel? Ah, I've heard of biodiesel. No, no, no. Renewable diesel. And more importantly, what's this new thing we're hearing about called a sustainable aviation fuel? I haven't heard of that, Damien. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. You're going to hear more about it now. Pete Meyer, S&P Global Commodity Insights, fuel expert, uh, guy on Wall Street, advisor to the biggest companies on the planet. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you for that very elaborate introduction. I'm not sure I can I can uh, live up to it, but uh, it's I think a pleasure to be here. To I think you can live it's up a pleasure to, to be here with you again, Damien. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, so uh, you and I recorded some stuff for Extreme Ag, and dear listener, you probably know that I am recording content for the Extreme Ag platform. If you haven't seen any of that, Extreme Ag is five large-scale, progressive, forward-thinking, success-minded, record-setting farmers that put this platform together. They do product trials. They also put out all kinds of information on the extremeag.farm website. I encourage you to go and check that out. Pete and I met because of Jared Creed and because of Extreme Ag. I recorded some stuff with him there. There, Pete, that is. And then he also was on my Business of Agriculture Success Group as a guest presenter. Well, here he is now to talk about everything from used cooking oil to sustainable aviation fuel to this new thing called renewable diesel that very likely could change the entire consumption pattern and even acres planted for soybeans and other oil seeds. Now, we've heard this song and dance before, um, but some of it came to fruition. Ethanol is using about 37, 38, 36% of the corn crop. It's real. Maybe that's what's going to happen on the soy biodiesel thing. All right, let's start at the beginning. Right now, diesel is about $5.29 a gallon. We are recording this, you and I, uh, first, second week of June, 2022, Pete. Uh, gasoline every day, just log on to Facebook and all your friends are taking pictures of the, the gas pump and how much it's costing them to fill up their, their car. They're mad. Fuels through the roof. Then there's this whole thing, is the administration and is this being invented and cast upon us to force us into electric cars? Maybe. If we have electric cars, do we need ethanol? I'm just going to throw it out there. What's this all look like? Help me out. Boy, if you, really, you really start with the easy question. So um, the issue that we have at the moment is not a, a shortage of oil. It's a shortage of refining capacity. So on the East Coast, for example, where a lot of gasoline and diesel demand obviously occurs, we had about 1.6 million barrels a day of refining capacity 10 years ago. That number is down to 800,000. Why? We cut, why cut, we cut it in half. We cut the refining capacity in the most populous region of the United States of America in half in the last decade. Correct. So when you talk to the oil refiners, you know, and I and I talk to them quite often, you know, they're they're like Pete. If you don't think we're running at 101 percent. 24 and a half hours a day, given the profit margins, you don't understand our business. I mean, that's just the way it is. But the problem is they can't keep up. And so it's not, 
Yeah, some of the some of the Russian oil being cut out has something to do with it because some of the refiners like that oil. Uh, it's a little bit lighter, so they can refine it a little bit easier. But the fact of the matter is, is that refining capacity is the issue. So then you say, okay, well, how did that become an issue? Well, that became an issue because we lost some refiners. Refiners went bankrupt for various reasons. Um, and and the fact of the matter is that the smaller refiners got squeezed out. So now you only have the big refiners are left. And what happened? Well, you had a just-in-time economy before the pandemic, which has proven to be an absolute disaster, this just-in-time economy. And now you had to restock everybody's shelves. So whether that's trains, planes, automobiles, uh, trucks, whatever, the demand is higher. And we have less capacity to, to, to refine this uh, <clears throat> to refine oil into into diesel and sustainable aviation fuel and uh, and and gasoline. So here's where the, here's where the problem was. Okay. So, so, now, you say, so now you say now you say okay, why aren't you? Well, then why aren't refineries? Why aren't these oil companies building building new refineries? Well, the fact of the matter is they're not building new refineries because they can see the writing on the wall, and the writing on the wall is for electric vehicles. Um, you know, I mean, I don't think. Personally, I don't think the administration is trying to push it. Are they proponents of it? Well, certainly they are. But I mean, the fact of the matter is that you have a lot of these companies that, that, that Elon Musk started with Tesla, and now every other company, whether it be Ford, GM, whatever, have just said, look, we're going electric. We think that this is it. This is going to make a difference in, in the global climate. And the fact of the matter is, is that Ford, Ford uh, Mercedes-Benz, and, uh, and GM have all said, they're not going to produce gasoline internal combustion engines 10 years from now. Yeah. So if you're a refining business, you're saying to yourself, I'm not going to build a refinery. What do I care? Yeah. So the fact of the matter is that the electrification of this, um, of the U S auto fleet, not necessarily truck fleet, but the U S auto fleet, uh, auto fleet, you know, this is, this is a problem. This yeah, is, so is it, is it, um, a number of things. First off, you referenced the just-in-time economy. For those people that are listening, and we got all kinds of ag professionals that listen to this, but if they maybe, uh, first off, it's a newer concept. It came about really in the 80s and 90s. It's a Japanese manufacturing concept back when Japan was the roaring economy that it was uh, coming out of the 70s through the 80s. The idea with that, why warehouse stuff, why inventory stuff, why have excess goods on hand, get exactly what you need right when you need it. And therefore, your money's not tied up and your warehouse doesn't uh, need to be as big, full of a bunch of crap. That was the whole just in time thing. We saw that it didn't work really well on food supplies when all of a sudden meat plants were shut down and uh, inventory got really skinny. You're talking about that with fuel. But here's the thing. <clears throat> you just said that. Um, the just-in-time economy made it so that we weren't refining as much fuel because we just were doing it more in a just-in-time. Is that to propose that there's been a time in our history where airlines or railroads or truck fleets would be sitting on like six months worth of fuel? That seems unreasonable. Like maybe they would have sat on a few days worth. Nobody ever sat on three to six months worth of fuel, did they? No. What I what I what I tried to what I, what I said there, and I'm I'm sorry if it didn't come out right, was that. The just-in-time economy before the pandemic has turned out to be the bane of our existence because what happened was when everybody tried to restock, having been used to this just-in-time economy, when everybody tried to restock when the pandemic you know, started to subside, even though we have these flashes back and forth, mm -hmm. there was then all of a sudden there was huge demand for fuel to restock everybody. So what I was saying is that the just-in-time economy now, how did we end up in a just time economy? You brought that up very well in the history lesson about the Japanese, but you know what exasperated the just just in time economy? Amazon Prime, yeah. FedEx, yeah. Had positively needed tomorrow. I mean, okay, let yeah. me get out. Let me get on my Amazon Prime. I get it in two days. If I have to go to my, you know, instead instead of getting my shampoo, let's say from my local uh, pharmacy or whatever, I go on Amazon Prime. If I have to go to my pharmacy. He, he or she, that, that owner may not have it anymore because they couldn't get it via truck, but Amazon will get it to my door. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Got it. So yeah, the, what the JIT uh, thing really did was it put a whole bunch of demand for fuel all at once. I find it interesting. Also the same people that, um, you know, what, there was a political moment to it also, Pete, that same people that had all over their Facebook posts that staying home would save a life probably bend a little bit left 
And they also were against the economy reopening, but they also would be the first ones to tell you that everything we do as human existence is bad for the environment. Meanwhile, they're ordering shampoo delivered from Amazon in a truck that burns diesel. <laughs> For, you know, it's, it's, it's true. Right. I mean, every time, every time you look at, uh, you know, you, you turn on your, your TV, somebody else would say, you know, whether it be Uber or whatever. Okay. So Uber used to drive you somewhere. Then they would deliver food to you. Now they deliver groceries to you. Yeah. You know, is that, you know, using Uber to deliver five people's groceries versus five people going to the grocery store, is that saving any fuel or whatever? It's such a little consequence that it really just, but, but I mean, this is just, you know, we've become lazy. Yeah, well, lazy. that's the point also that if, Who you, cares? if you loaded up and went to the store and brought home $400 worth of stuff, it's probably still more fuel efficient than having ooh, Amazon pull in to drop one box of shampoo. Then tomorrow they pull in and drop you a box of shoes. Then tomorrow after that, they pull in and drop totally you agree. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, totally agree. So, so we got a boatload of demand for this uh, fuel. That's true. Um, but as our fuel consumption really moved? No. It's just that the capacity to make it got squeezed down. We are not burning any, we're not burning more fuel today in the summer of 2022 than we would have, let's say in a normal year of June of 2019. Right. Right. That's, that's, that's correct. If anything, you know, I mean, what, what kind of happened here as well is that with the pandemic, a lot of these, a lot of these refining companies just kind of eased their, so there were no stocks, right? And that's really the issue. I mean, in the in the East Coast, I think it was three weeks ago, there was no, there was barely any jet fuel left. You had planes were flying to Chicago to get jet fuel. And what jet fuel that they were buying, let's say at LaGuardia or Kennedy Airport or Newark Airport, one of those, or Boston Logan, was like 50% higher than what they were paying in Chicago. So okay. some of these guys, so some of these airlines have to fly to other 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 places to get it. So no, it's a but it's a it's a real problem on the East Coast. There's no question we're finding capacity in the East Coast. Other parts of the country, not quite so bad. But as you suggested earlier, where, where's your demand? Your demand is on both coasts. Yeah, that's where the people are. Okay, let's talk about that as it pertains to agriculture. So we've got less capacity. My farm guys are paying five dollars twenty nine cents for diesel or some crazy number like this, depending if there's no road tax on it. But the point is, we're paying record, really record prices for diesel. And you say that there's this thing out there. Uh, we already talked about ethanol. And we'll get back to that. But let's stick with the bio diesel, renewable diesel. I've heard about it for the first time this winter. And I'm around ag all the time. I speak at meetings and agriculture all around. And finally, this winter, I hear about renewable diesel. I'm like, what the hell are they talking about? And then they talk about the potential uh, uh, demand that this might present for soybean products. Is this for real? Are we going to? Oh. And, and, and as the, the reason, the point is, we can force electric cars or even car companies can force electric cars onto us, but we can't electrify every over the road truck and every locomotive and every uh, uh, <laughs> cargo ship because that's just too much. I mean, it's cargo ship burns hundreds of gallons of diesel probably every hour or something to chug across the Pacific. So mm -hmm. that's where we're going to need this stuff, right? Yeah, no, there's no question. But I mean, the yeah, environmental concerns, the investments in ESG, uh, that sort of stuff has, has has kind of driven this that way, driven this to to uh, you know to to where we are now. And you know, you ask if it's real, is renewable diesel real? Is sustainable aviation fuel real? Um, it's real. It's as real as the refineries want to make it. And the reason I say that is because you know, you and I have both sat through the ethanol boom or whatever where it was very flimsily financed, mm -hmm. okay? You had local co-ops or- or, Ooh, or Four farmers. I, I, know right. of, I know of ethanol plants, Pete, that was four. Oh, they weren't dumb. They weren't bad business people, but they were four farmers versus Exxon. <laughs> you right. know, yeah, four right. farmers uh, mean, funding an, an ethanol plant. And, and meanwhile, Exxon and, 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 and all the rest of them were fighting them the whole way because they didn't want to use a product they didn't have control over, right? But let's, let's be honest about it. Exxon and 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 the and I'm not just picking on Exxon and the rest of the oil companies needed something as an oxygen unit to take the place of MTBE because MTBE was a carcinogenic substance and ethanol fit that void. But regardless, but now all of a sudden you have oil companies that that were fighting you on ethanol and trying to drive you out of business yeah. or take control of it. Now they're embracing the farmer, embracing the product in the form of vegetable oils. They're embracing all the garbage that was so fats and tallows and greases and used cooking oil, because rather than on something like biodiesel, where they would mix it together and then add it to um, fossil fuel, 
um, what they do with uh, renewable diesel, it's a drop in fuel. So they take all that stuff, and I'm not calling vegetable oils garbage, but we'll get into why, why there's such demand for that. But the rest of the stuff, fats, tallows, greases, used cooking oil, uh, even corn oil, and they, and they put it in a refinery, and it's called, what's called a drop-in fuel. You put it in, it comes out as fuel. Easy yeah. as pie. Yeah, whereas the other stuff heretofore, uh, the stuff that we made was a supplement at best. You know, we put right. E15 right. or whatever, 10%. And we, then we, we stuck it in other fossil fuels. Right. And then when you start to look at what's called a CI score, a carbon intensity score. So a carbon intensity score is very, very high for diesel and, and gasoline. Let's call it 100 let's just say. And then you start to look at stuff like fuel that's made out of soybean oil, maybe has a CI score 30 or 40% less than that. Yep. Fuel made out of fats and tallows and the rest of this garbage has a carbon intensity score, you know, 70% less than that. So now you have certain states like California, Washington, and Oregon to start to say, you know what, we have a pollution problem. We have a, a liberal population that wants to do something about this problem. We, we really haven't heard much from them, even though we have the highest gasoline price around. So guess what? We're going to fund or we're going to subsidize the production of these of these um, of these renewable fuels and sell it to our constituency as being better for the environment. Is it better for the environment? Yes, it is very much so. But the fact of the matter is, is that it, it, it comes at a huge cost because it takes about seven and a half pounds of soil oil to make a gallon of of uh, of, uh, of diesel, of renewable, of renewable diesel. diesel. So that's. That's at 80 cents, that's $6 a gallon. Well, okay. You say, well, your farmer friends are paying $5 and change. That includes the taxes and everything else. There's no money in there. So there has to be subsidies or tax credits that come from local state governments. This is not a federal mandate, okay? Yeah. This is called the Low Carbon Fuel Standard, LCFS. And so far, it's been implemented by the big three states that go up and down the West Coast. And there's certainly going to be more in the in the future, if not a federal mandate, and the reason we say the federal mandate is because in the recent in the most recent um, uh, uh, dispatch from the EPA, which was last week, um, you know that what they said was that hey, oh by the way, we're looking at canola oil to have an approved pathway to the low carbon fuel standard. Everybody's like, whoa, wait a minute! So now all of a sudden they're paying attention to it too. So there is, unlike an ethanol, there is no federal mandate for the renewable diesel um, and sustainable aviation fuel at the moment. But it's sound, if we read between the lines, now already they're talking about canola, a couple other feedstocks. You're saying to yourself, yeah, okay. Yep, see that coming, that's coming. Okay, so diesel's the most likely thing. Certainly it's the, the least likely to be replaced with um, with electric cars because diesel ends up in, in you know tractors and, and combines on our front. But as you and I talked about in my business of ag group, that's still a uh, that's still a, a very small percentage of the total diesel burned when you talk about freights, cargo ships, tr semi trucks, over the road trucks, and then locomotives. So you're saying that we're going to end up doing this, and there's it's not because George W. Bush passed the renewable fuel standard; it's because these companies see this coming, and they are smart because they also have they have ears and eyes on Wall Street. They have paid access to information. Frankly, let's face it, because they have billions of dollars at play. And so when the, um, when the big oil companies are investing in renewable diesel to be made out of oil seeds, soybean, canola, et cetera, you're saying this is going to be a real thing. You gave a chart in my business of ag success group. You showed a chart where consumption was whatever it was, 759 million gallons or something. Uh, and then you basically projected that it's going to be three to three and a half times that in the next two years. Kind of expand on that. That's that's production capacity. So production capacity for the plants that were out there starting in uh, January first of twenty one was at was at seven hundred, but what, but in the seven hundred uh, million gallons. But now we're talking about three billion gallons, or or even even numbers even higher than that. And that comes from the fact that all these oil companies have said, okay, we're building, and the map that you refer to just shows all these locations, we monitor the news like everybody else. And we put all these locations onto a map and you can, you can see how it goes. And as you, as you go from maybe 10 plants in 01, you go to maybe 50, 60, 70 plants by the time we get to 2024. But what, what and we are calling the uh, cart in front of the horse or, you know, whatever, whatever you want to call it, it's one thing to build these plants. It's quite something else to have enough feedstock. 
And that's why you're hearing more and more about, you know, these 15 new soy crush uh, plants being either built or modernized in the United States. I mean, you know, nobody gave a flying, you know, what about, about soybean crush plants five years ago. And now oil companies are throwing hundreds of millions of dollars at big processors to say, Hey, let's get this better. Hey, let's, let's build another plant. Hey, let's, let's do this. Let's do that. And in return for our hundreds of millions of dollars, we want a guaranteed right of first refusal on 100% of the soy oil that you produce. We don't care what you do with the meal. Don't care. We want the oil. So, you know, the fact, and, and going back to say, where I say, where you say, okay, Pete, you, you say this is going to happen. As we as we touched on just recently, this is this is a deep pocket territory. Mm-hmm. This is big money. And again, and no offense to the four farmers that I knew that uh, invested in an ethanol plant. Again, they're business people. They they're well off business people, but they still can't compete with Marathon and and with uh, Chevron and with uh, Royal Dutch Shell. I mean, you're talking about you're talking about the richest farmer you know still is a pimple on the ass of Royal Dutch Shell. I mean, they're a global fossil fuel company that's you know been around. It's the it's the fusion of BP and Shell, which were the two two of the biggest. It's remarkable, and they're coming to biodiesel, renewable diesel, which means they want the stuff. They see the handwriting on the wall that if it's not a federal standard right now it's going to be and the the what the i guess the calculus is we're not going to electrify all of these diesel engines as we already discussed it's just you need too much horsepower to do so and it's also just not even pragmatic it's just not even it's maybe not even possible they're saying maybe eventually we have electric over the road trucks maybe someday we have a battery operated cargo ships i can't even imagine that happening so the point is their calculus is we're going to need this stuff there's going to be environmental pressure on us we're going soy or canola or whatever but it's bio based diesel why is in the difference between biodiesel in the old days and renewable is this one's a drop in product not an additive right Correct. So this one has a lower CI score if you just drop drop in the fuel. Okay. And, and then the calculus that I just said, the calculus yeah. I just said, is the money they've calculated these huge organizations that have been in the energy business forever, as opposed to again the four farmers with an ethanol plant, they've been in corn production, they ain't been in the energy business. Energy companies that have been fueling transportation for their entire existence are in. And one could make the argument that if this is what they want, this is what they're going to get because they have the money to pay for it. They have, the politi- they have the political influence to make it happen. It's, a, it's an unfortunate commentary on, on our society. You know, we, we see this with everything from guns to oil, right? I mean, it's just, we, we, we have a transaction. We have a transactional money government. Right, money talks and bullshit walks. We have a transactional government is what you're saying. And, and there are folks that still don't want to believe that. But unfortunately, it's true. it is true. I mean, you look at what these people spend to run for office. Yeah. And and you know you know why I mean we're getting out of tangent here you know why they spend they spend that money to get the office so they can so they can trade on insider information but I digress yes and you're not wrong um, and it's not a political statement it's an accurate statement if you don't believe it you're you're probably foolish or naive um, let's look about then what this means for the soybean production we were, we got about 90 million acres of soybeans in the United States of America it's roughly the same amount as corn you already corrected me when USDA originally said we would produce more acres of soybeans. We have more acres of soybeans this year, third time ever in our history. You said it's roughly about the same, so we're not going to have more. Just, but still, that's just our that's just our opinion. Watching watching the economics of corn versus the economics of beans after the report came out on March thirty first, we could so be we, wrong. I mean, but so the main just, thing is we it's still be close. It's going to be close in our opinion. If thirty six to thirty seven or thirty eight percent of our corn runs through an ethanol plant. What might bio di- renewable diesel do for soybean demand? Will we end up where one third of our crop goes into that? We'll take it all. That's a big statement. That's a big statement, by the way. But that's, before before, like, before you answer it. that, before you answer that, it's such a big statement. I'm going to leave it right there for a second. We're going to cut now to a commercial and we're going to come back. I want you to hear right now from my friends at Pattern Ag. A question for farmers and agricultural land owners. Have you ever lost yield to unexpected pest or disease? 
Well, of course you have, because every season you're forced to guess about some of the most important management decisions. But now you don't have to guess. Pattern Ag offers the most advanced soil analysis available today. In addition to a comprehensive nutrient analysis, like any soil sample survey is going to do for you, Pattern can predict next season's risk from the most damaging of pests and diseases, including corn rootworm, soybean cyst nematode, sudden death syndrome, and more. So for the first time ever, a single soil analysis can help you optimize your crop protection and fertility spend at a subfield, field, and operational level. Time to refine your management decisions. Time to optimize your inputs and maximize your yield. Simply go to www.pattern.ag and get started today. All right, Pete Meyer, S&P Global, come out of the insights. Before we went to commercial, you gave me one heck of a tease to drop that commercial in right there. You just said, I said, if 36 to 38% of the corn crop goes to ethanol and this renewable diesel thing is real, how much of our soybean crop might go to renewable diesel? And you said, we'll take it all. For God's sakes, now you're really going to make your upset the apple cart. When I go to the store and there's no Wesson oil, uh, or whatever it is that uses soybean oil. When I can't get vegetable oil to make my French fries, it's because it's all going to diesel. I'm getting, I'm getting scared here. Tell me about it. Well, the fact of the matter is, is that we see unencumbered growth in Brazil. Okay, so Brazil is growing. We, we, we think they'll grow 150 million metric tons of, of soybeans this year. China's demand is kind of flat at 100 million. We've been losing that export war to China for years now. And that's just going to become worse. So this actually comes at a good time. I, of course, facetiously say, yeah, we'll take it all. But the fact of the matter is, is that we could probably, and when I say we, I mean the renewable diesel, and I'm not, I'm not part of the renewable diesel industry, but renewable diesel industry would take all the soil we produce in this country. Yeah. Now, is, that, is that possible? No, it's not. But, well, but, because there's, but because we, there's other demand. There's other de- sources of demand. Correct. There's the, the company that makes and bottles vegetable oil that I buy at Kroger is going to say, wait a minute, we're still all, we're also buying oil. And look, and look there's, there's certainly organizations out there like the National Baking Association that takes, that takes the umbrage with what I, with what I'm saying, right? Because as you suggest, that would, that would crush them. So I'm not, but I'm saying that the, what happens here is that if, and we don't have the crush capacity to crush every bean that we produce in this country either, right? So we are, we are a little bit kind of making making a story here. But the fact of the matter is that if all these plants come to fruition, we could use all of it. We could, yeah. we, we yeah. could, I mean, at the moment, at the moment, we only produce about 25 billion pounds of, of soy oil. In our, in our opinion, we could, you could add 50% of that to five in five years. And yeah. where's that going to come from? The exports, the exports to China, we're not going to export any bean oil, even though we don't export much bean oil. And we'll just keep the beans at home. This is what we call the domestication of the U.S. soybean supply. Yeah, and I think this is a remarkable discussion. First off, to the person that maybe listens to this that's in the cranberry industry, they're probably saying, I'm not sure I understand this crush thing. Real quickly, to make soybeans into oil, you go through a crush process. That's why for something to become soybean oil, it goes through crush. The other that's not going through a crush ends up as meal. Am I right? Correct. So you crush a bean and you get two products. 19% of it comes out last year, 19, and let's call it 20%. 20% of it of the weight comes out in oil. 80% of it comes out in meal, which, which is going to become cheap feed for your protein sector. So 60 pound bushel of soybeans, 20% of that, which would be 12, 12 pounds, pounds, comes out as oil. And then the remainder, 48 pounds roughly, comes out as soybean meal, which yeah. then, and soybean meal gets utilized by going, getting put into livestock rations. Correct. That Those are rough numbers because they're like little husks and stuff like that. Sure, sure. There's all, it's, not, it's not exactly pure, but for this conversation, Two products, 20% oil, 80% meal. Yeah, yep. right. And there's yeah, there's a little bit that's going to be some sort of other byproduct. But yeah, for Correct. this conversation, it's roughly 80 so, yeah, it's um, so 20% of that. And so we're going to use it all because then to make to make soy diesel or biodiesel, renewable diesel, it has to begin with oil. You already said the economics of that are not good until you add in tax incentives or downright outright subsidies. You think that those things are going to happen because A, the companies can go to Washington with a briefcase full of cash and hookers and make that legislation happen. And also- I didn't say that. I didn't say that. You said that. Go ahead. I did say that. It's okay. We, but you and I both agree we live in a transactional uh, government. There's another reason that it happens, and that's because there's environmental pressures. And then there's also pragmatism and the reality of economics out there in the marketplace. We need diesel and we, uh, we could uh, change. Now, 
what if all of a sudden the politics of uh, are such that uh, they say, you know, another Trump comes in and says, drill, baby, drill. You know what? We don't want, we don't want our soybeans going to diesel by God drill, go out there to the Bakken and drill, go to Texas and drill, go to Oklahoma, go to Alaska and get every last bit of that crude. And you know what? We're going to open a pipeline. Let's bring that stuff down from Alberta as Trudeau called it, that dirty Alberta oil, bring it down too. If that happens, does this whole soy diesel thing go away? No, because the fact of the matter is that, as we discussed earlier, it's not the oil supply that's hurting, that's causing these this ramp up in prices. It's the fact we don't have refinery capacity. And are they going to approve all of a sudden these new additional dirty refiner capacity, given the fact that they're already everybody in the world seems to be concerned about the about the uh, the climate in the world? No. So it uh, it doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't. Okay. What might this all, do? all I can say is that if all that if all that does happen, you better have a lot of storage capacity. Uh, for, 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 gonna, for, for yeah, you're not gonna, yeah, yeah. And look, um, this is let's let's be clear about this, Damien. This is not just the U.S., right? Europe is light years ahead of us on this. Mm-hmm. You know, if you talk about a country like a small country like the Netherlands, for instance, I mean, they've banned internal combustion engines inside the city of Amsterdam for deliveries and whatever. Else. I mean, you know, they're working towards that. It's a few years away, but I mean, the fact of the matter is, is that they are light years ahead of us. So. They are the ones that are that are using all sorts of stuff, rapeseed or canola oil, as we talk about. Use cooking oil, absolutely use a ton of that. Um, any any sort of uh, uh, oil seed, with the exception of sunflower oil that they got from Ukraine, because sunflower oil is used for mostly for cooking. But then you use that sunflower oil for cooking, and then that used cooking oil goes back in into your truck or into your car or into your diesel engine. The Europeans are, are way ahead of this. Way because- Incidentally, dear, dear listener, he likes to bring up the Netherlands because he is from Dutch stock. And, you know, they're a very proud people, those Dutch. They're also very tall and cheap. They're tall, cheap, and proud. And I think that, and they're smart. So they're tall, cheap, proud, and smart. So it wraps up all of them. He's of Dutch heritage. But by the way, the name over there would have been spelled with a J, I think. It's not normal. I-J. Yes, I J M M E I J E R, and yes, and I, I'll take I'll take all those attributes, including the bad one, of being cheap. But that's just you know, we call it frugal. <laughs> all right, you talked about uncooked oil because it's not just because you 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 made a point that in a the thing we did in the business of ag group <laughs> that there is a company that takes up all this un this uh, used. Used, used, up. used. It's not uncooked. It's used. So essentially, the stuff that's in a fryer, when I go to McDonald's to get my French fries, that stuff comes out. That oil goes somewhere because it's after it's used up, it's no longer good. It doesn't fry as well. Whatever. That oil becomes diesel, but it doesn't even happen here in the U.S. Uh, it doesn't happen in the U.S. So you know, in in Western Europe and and the the Netherlands as well. I'll, I'll give I'll give. My, my home country a plug. I mean, what happens is is that uh, they use a lot more cooking oil than we do. They they, they just do. So uh, Europe in, imports a lot of used cooking oil from China, which also uses a lot of oil. But the U.S. doesn't really use as much oil, except for as you say, the the deep fryers and the fast food places. That oil is actually exported by a company called Nestle, not Nestle, Nestle, which is one of the largest renewable uh, fuel uh, companies in the world. That used cooking oil from the U.S. gets exported to Singapore and then gets refined in Singapore and then comes back into California as renewable diesel and they make a profit. So uh, we could be doing that here. We talk about reshoring and nearshoring stuff as we've yep. gotten burned from the whole globalization. There's going to be a deglobalization going on, in my opinion. And part of deglobalization could mean that used cooking oil might stay on shore and then get made into fuel as part of this thing. Do you see that happening? Oh yeah. Every renewable diesel producer that we, that we talked to said, yep, we'll take the used cooking oil. They okay. actually want that. They want that more than they want the soybean oil. They want to use cooking oil. They want the fats and the tallows and the greases and corn oil too, which is your, a byproduct of ethanol production. I'll take that. Incidentally, as well. I referenced Wesson oil, which is the brand name. I think it technically is corn oil, not soy oil, I think, but I, I don't, I haven't looked at their label in a long time. Um, what's this mean for prices? All of a sudden, should I be bullish? If I'm an Iowa soybean farmer, should I go to every auction I can and leverage the hell out of myself and buy all the acres I can? Because uh, in two years, my soybeans are going to be selling for 20 bucks a bushel and I'm going to be a rich guy. 
No, it's not. It's not an infinite. It's not an infinite uh, price price curve as far as we're concerned. As far as bean oil is concerned, I mean, it, it, given the current environment, there's probably a lot of demand for bean oil between sixty five and seventy cents. The current market for bean oil is about eighty cents, but you have a lot of speculators in the front. If you look at the futures curve, futures curve looks like a uh, looks like a black diamond ski slope, right? Because yeah. all the invest, all the all the speculative money is in the front. On the back end, it's about seventy seventy five cents. And the renewable diesel guys are like, yeah, okay. Given what's going on in Ukraine, given you know poor you know poor soybean crop in Brazil last year, that makes sense to us. But that could change if Brazil produces 150 million metric tons and we have a decent soybean crop here. Now all of a sudden it goes to, it goes you know the price goes down no matter what the no matter what the demand is. So do and acres, and especially if we don't have especially if we don't have. Um, enough crush capacity to keep it inside, which we won't for a couple of years. We, we won't have enough crush capacity until 2025 to make a difference in our Okay, market. so we need a few more years to make this happen. Does that mean, does, do soy acres change? Do we grow more soybean? Do we surpass 90? Do we surpass 100 million acres of soybeans in three years in this country? Dam- Damien, as you know, it's, it's very difficult to plant soy on soy. It's much easier to plant corn on corn. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not an agronomist. I don't play one on TV. Right. But the fact that but the fact that the matter is, is that that soy they that there has to be some work done there on the on, on folks that want to plant soy on soy. And for us to plant 100 million acres, we would have to plant soy on soy. Yeah. Or, or somehow utilize wheat acres and, and do the double cropping thing. And then you got an issue. Well, the, wheat acre, the wheat acres would probably go to canola, in our opinion, rather than winter wheat in Kansas. We hear a lot from the seed companies that there are some. Uh, individual farmers out there that are interested in planting can- winter canola again, the crop that is not very well, uh, not widespread uh, grown in the U.S. And then as we've talked about previously as well, there's a lot of interest in cover crops, whether it be pennycress or camelina and those those crops, not the easiest thing in the world to grow. But the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, we're, we're you know, if what I say is true and Brazil is able to take care of China and Brazil can export 100 million tons, which we think they can, and China's demand is 100 million tons, we could be left out in the cold. Let's be honest about it. Brazil is a much, much more friendlier country to China than we are. And they're certainly a friendlier country to Russia than we are, as was evident by the fact that the Ags minister said last week that they have plenty of fertilizer to plant next year's crop, something that as analysts, we didn't think was going to happen. Yeah. So what we're hearing is uh, obviously China with their Belt and Road Initiative, basically colonial colonialism uh, uh, via the the Chinese money. They're going to just go ahead and put in the infrastructure in Brazil and make sure they're extracting the resources from Brazil. Brazil plays along because it's good for their economy to do so, and also play nice with Russia and get the fertilizer that we may not. Okay. So it's price positive for us to do this. It's good for the American farmer to do this. It's good probably for the American consumer to do this. Let's go from biodiesel, renewable diesel, I'm sorry, to sustainable aviation fuel. You told me that all this ethanol that we, 36 to 38% of the corn crop makes ethanol. Ethanol goes into the gas because of the renewable fuel standard that's been in place for almost 20 years now. People bitch about it. The food for fuel debate comes up every time food prices get high. Somebody goes to buy cornflakes, they blame it on ethanol. The cornflakes went up a dollar, which is not really the reason, but that's okay because uh, the American consumer bitches and then the news media covers it. But now you're saying, you know what? Ethanol can go away for the cars. Ethanol will go away because electric cars don't need it, but we're still going to need ethanol because we're going to fuel the jets. Tell me about that. So uh, last year, so initially when we started to look at renewable fuels, we thought that sustainable aviation fuel was going to be made from, and, and it's still, there, there are plants out there that will do that. They'll make sustainable aviation fuel out of the fats and the tallows and everything we've just talked about. But then along comes last year or the fall of last year, maybe over the winter, where ADM makes an announcement that they're going to, sh- they're going to, in, in two or three years time, they're going to, to uh, deviate the path of their ethanol uh, from the uh, gasoline companies. And they're going to send half of their production, which is 900 million gallons, to GIVO. GIVO is a sustainable aviation fuel manufacturer, two big ones in the U.S., GIVO and uh, Lanza. And when I say big ones, that's a relative term because it's still a a business that's uh, in its infancy. So 900 million gallons of ethanol can turn into 500 million gallons of jet fuel. That's the the way that works. So when we look at it, um, we produced and and, uh, we produced about 15.8 billion gallons of ethanol in 2019, before the pandemic, if we use that conversion, 
we can make almost 9 billion gallons of jet fuel, which is somewhere between a third and a half of total jet fuel consumption. In this Just country. in the U.S.? Yep. So if we used every gallon of ethanol made at the roughly 200 ethanol plants in the U.S., which are mostly all in the Corn Belt, of course, so about 200 plants, making about 16 billion gallons of ethanol. We do the conversion to make it into sustainable aviation fuel because it's got to have to go through some more process, whatever. That satisfies one half of domestic consumption of, of aviation fuel. Well, aviation fuel was very, very, demand was very, very high in 19, it was about 24. Well, let's call it, let's call it 21 or 22 and we can produce nine. So yeah, a little bit less than half if we convert it at all. That's a no, we're not going to, we're not, we're not going to convert it all, but the fact of the matter is, is that that was a very, very big announcement in our opinion. Uh, and granted, it's only a memo of understanding. I, I totally understand that. But when, a, when the one of the top three ethanol producers in the United States says, "Yeah, guess what? We're going to we're going to deviate the path of half of our ethanol production in 2024, 2025." And it's going to go to make sustainable aviation fuel. Everybody stood up and took notice. And okay, now that's one thing you just said. One of the biggest three ethanol producers being ADM, right? Correct. Okay. Poet, now, now Poet you ADM and Valero. Yeah. So what is it again? Poet AV, ADM and Valero. Okay. Here's the thing. You and I both know, as do my listeners, they're smart professionals in agriculture. Making it is part of the thing. You need demand for the stuff, and that's the other one that I think has struck me. There's four airlines that control 82%, I think it is, of passenger uh, carrying in the United States of America. You know, it's an oligopoly. One of those big four is United Airlines, and you said that they have been in contact with you. They're all they're they're very open about it. They want to be they want to buy and they want to use sustainable aviation fuel. So instead of just saying our ADM can make the crap, we got a customer that wants to buy the crap, right? Right. They, but they, they're, they said they want it, but they're also pragmatic about it. So in other words, if the price makes sense for them, then they're going to buy it. But they're also, they're also, there is a pragmatism there. Cause you, you know, we talked a little bit before about you saying about the soybean price just being in an upward trajectory, blah, 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 blah. Right. I get that. But the fact of the matter is that they, you know, and they're looking at other different technologies as well. They're looking at wood chips out of Georgia. They're looking at a whole bunch of stuff. Now, do they like it? They love it. I've talked to the engineers, these these uh, aeronautical engineers. It burns so clean in these engines that that should be no, no news to your to your listeners, considering the considering the octane and the fact that NASCAR uses it to you know to produce. I mean, it's just it's a clean burning fuel that they that they really like, and and they see even less stress on their fuel delivery systems in these jets, and you know, yeah, and it it. it it checks the box on ESG, right? It checks yeah, the now, environmental now they, box. Now they can go and tell all of their stockholders as Correct. well as their passengers like me that are on the airplane. By the way, they got you captive. You sit in that goddamn seat and they they, they bombard you with self-promotion half the time you're sitting there tell, making you ask you to buy, use their credit cards, all that. Now they can say, we are environmentally conscious because we use sustainable aviation fuel made of uh, corn. Um, is there another crop? that could do this. Um, and you, I asked you this previously, but I want you to answer for these listeners. Switchgrass. Uh, there's all sorts of crap you can use to make ethanol. And your big point was quite simply. Not enough quantity. Yeah. It's just not enough. Not 93, enough 93 million acres of corn at yeah. 180 some bushels makes a hell of a lot of quantity. And, of food stock. and you know, if there's one thing I've learned in my, in my 40 years in the business, don't bet against genetics because, you know, we'll be a 200 bushel an acre here on a national average, probably, I don't know, Five years. 10 years, 12 Ten years. Yeah. Yeah. How, how, how are you going to argue against that? You can't argue against the history of it. And we don't quite have, and we don't have that biologically um, um, advanced uh, switchgrass uh, research going on that we do for corn. No, um, no. We also remember. don't have, we also don't have, you know, I think it was maybe the statistic that, that I heard was maybe five or six years ago, 95 cents of every dollar uh, of every research dollar at the seed company was going to corn. Now you don't see that anymore. Now you see like the soybean genetics are starting to pick right. up a little bit, right? You're spending a little bit more money on your soybean genetics. Is that because of renewable diesel? No, but it plays into the hand. If you're talking about that's on research, let's talk about, you think 95 cents on every dollar of, uh, of advertising at the seed companies goes to give hats and shirts to these farmers. Cause that's all they wear. I mean, every, I always say these, these farmers right. have two, these farmers have two outfits, plaid for dress up days and then free crap from the seed and chemical companies. Right. Who doesn't want a free hat? 
farmers <laughs> want a free hat. Who doesn't want a free hat? I want a free hat too. But it is funny, you know. I've been on I've been on Chip Flory's Pro Farmer Crop Tour for 15 years. This will be the 16th year. And when you show up there, the seed companies are there. They have a table full of free hats. That's the first table that gets emptied, rather than some other tchotchkes that somebody else is trying to give you, like a yeah. like a, a thumb drive or something like that. Hey. Let's, here's an idea. Well, let's go to a farmer's show. Do we offer the hats or a thumb drive? Oh, let's go with thumb drive. Nope, not a good idea. You would better off with the hats. My wife asked me if I needed all the hats in my closet. And remember, I'm not, I don't even buy agricultural inputs. They just give them to me because I speak at their conference. I think I have about 60 here and probably 30 at the Arizona house. And that's, and I don't think any of them are older than five or 10 years old. So anyway, let's talk about the fact that uh, the food for fuel debate that was bring every time food prices climb, then it's food for fuel is, is all of a sudden it going to be trendy to, to protest against United airlines saying United airlines uses fuel made out of corn that could be feeding people. Is that what's going to happen in a couple of years? The food versus fuel debate is cyclical, right? It started in 2008 when we start, when we, when we started to use ethanol in mass in 2012 with the drought, is it going to come up now? Yeah, maybe it comes up. But the fact of the matter is, is that, if we if if somebody takes a step back and looks at it, and let's say we can get to 200 bushel an acre, and let's say that we're not we're not using as much ethanol as as, as we are currently because the uh, uh, due to the electrification of the U.S. Uh, car fleet, you're gonna you know you're gonna need it. So what? But well, you know, does it make a difference environmentally? Yeah, it does make a difference environmentally. So, you know, yeah, I'm sure there's going to be some protests. There's going to be some protests on the on the soy oil side as well. But I mean, these are these are just you know trends or things that happen you know two, from time to time two statements about this first off i think a, a a good person should always be able to admit when they're wrong uh or or admit that they mispredicted i've been telling my ag audiences for five years ethanol was a short-term solution to a long-term problem long-term problem we had too much corn it's been going back to the 80s i remember the pick program for god's sakes i remember when they paid you in corn to not plant corn hence the pick payment in kind program we invented ethanol and we invented an ethanol mandate. And I said to my audience, starting five, six years ago, ethanol is going to come to a screeching halt. Electric cars, the legislation in places like Europe that's going to come to the United States. You can't have sell internal combustion cars. And here I am being corrected by you about the sustainable aviation fuel, if it's for real. So I guess the point is, is it for real? And secondly, can we make the crap in the poet plant that's down the road from me here in Manchester, Indiana? Or does it get made into a certain level of ethanol and then it goes from there to somewhere else? It just from what we understand and from what our engineers are telling us internally here, it just it's just a pure ethanol. So whether it gets on a railroad car and goes goes to a refinery in New Jersey or it goes to a sustainable aviation fuel plant in, in northern Indiana or, or the ones that are around the Atlanta Hartsfield and out in the West Coast, it doesn't matter. It just goes. So okay. the so the ethanol companies are just gonna continue to make the ethanol and the ethanol where the ethanol gets bid to just depends on the on the market price That's so it is it is a refinery that needs to be built it's a new kind of refinery that needs to get built and it might be uh down the road from chicago hair and then it, it, ethanol comes in which would make sense and then it gets made into this asaf right there yeah no it's true when you when you look at where these plants are um are proposed to sit it is they're right around LAX. They're right around ORD, and they're right around ATL. Right? That's that's where they are. I mean, I mean and, and probably Dallas Fort Worth as well. Even though I haven't sure, DFW, right. even though I haven't seen that, but, but that that makes that makes the most sense, right? I mean, that's Absolutely. what they're going to do. Yeah, we have a competitive geographical advantage here that we have the corn and we have uh, the airport uh, that's what that's second, correct. Or, second or third biggest in the world. All that's right, correct. what else? Uh, out the door here, um, we've been talking a lot about it. His name is Pete Meyer. Uh, we're talking about the future of biofuels. I'm excited about it. And I think if you're an ag, you should be because it looks like it might be for real. And again, I have to admit that I was wrong. Then I said ethanol came to a screeching halt in the next 10 years. It looks like maybe it doesn't. It just evolves. Out the door, what's your last thought on this? I, I, you know, I, I'm a pragmatic person, so I think you have to be pragmatic about it. I mean, is this is this coming along at the right time? Sure. Is, does it mean high prices forever? No. So I mean, you know, with the electrification of the of the of the car fleet, we need more demand. We need another demand segment for ethanol, and we've already put all this money into into uh, into ethanol plants. And you know, it's. It, it's it can be it can be a better product. So I think that while while I am pragmatic about it, I 
I do have some enthusiasm for it. But to your point as well, the way you started out with us saying, you know, you just heard about it over the winter. I will tell you that at the end of crop tour last year, one night in uh, in Iowa and one night in Minnesota, Chip Forey asked me to come up and talk about renewable diesel and sustainable aviation fuel. And the audience looks like deer in the headlights. So you're not you're not alone in this kind of, you know, is this for real? This is whatever. And yes, I think a, a healthy dose of uh, uh, of pragmatism is is required here. But everything we see uh, does does suggest that this is going to be a good product for ag and a good product for the environment. And I think I appreciate you saying that. By the way, that uh, even those of us that are in ag that talk ag and, and attend the meetings, this is kind of new to us. And so it, it's, but it's not new. The energy companies have been investing in it, so that tells me it's got wheels because they usually don't put money into. They might throw a few million dollars here and there. I get that, and they they certainly can lose. They can lose a few million, and it's not going to probably. Uh, you know, devastate them, but there's enough money coming in. And I, as we always know, if you want to know what's going on, follow the money. Right. And, and look, I mean, what you see, what you see with oil companies now is they are investing in this and they're investing in, in, uh, in share buybacks, right. They have, they have the money. There's no yeah, question about it. The, eth the ethanol business did not have the money. And, you know, the other thing too, is you talked about the head of the ethanol and I forget, I forget the guy's name, the head of the RFA, but I had a conversation with him on a radio show recently. And he has said that, like Jivo, Lanza Jet, all these companies are now members of the Renewable Fuel Association. Yeah. So what does that mean? Maybe it means nothing, but the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, they don't join these organizations just to have their name on the door. It no, they're, they're joining the organization. They're sending some of their people there for a reason. They want to know what's going on. Yeah. So I'll make exactly. sure I tell, I'll make sure I tell him he's not very memorable because neither you nor, no, I, can I, pull, what's, but neither what's you nor I can pull his name right off the top of our hat. We, and I've oh, had two no. podcasts with him. That just bothers me. Renewable Fuels Association. Jeff, Jeff, something or another. Yep, it is Jeff. All right. Hey, I'm going to uh, get out of here. If somebody wants to learn more about this, they could go to your company, S&P Global, come out of the insights and probably get all sorts of information downloaded, right? Right. Jeff Cooper is the guy's name. That's Jeff it, Jeff G. Cooper. Spelled with a G. G off, G off Cooper. Jeff Cooper. I'm going to make nice sure time. I share this with him too. I'm going to make sure I share this with him so he can realize that we, we, we love him so much. We forgot his name. He's a bald guy and you know what? He carries it well. All right. Um, if they want to kind of, if they want to find you, where do they find you? Pete.meyer, M-E-Y-E-R at spglobal.com. Got it. And, Thanks uh, for being here, my friend. He's Dutch, yeah, no which means what do we say? Dutch are smart, proud, tall, and cheap. And you know what? He, he willingly embraces all four of those. Give me, give me that. Give me all the soybean oil. No problem. I embrace <laughs> it all. His name is Pete Meyer. My name is Damian Mason. Share this with your friends. It's one of the best episodes we've ever recorded right here. And by the way, it's about the future of biofuel fuels. Till next time, it's the business of agriculture. This episode of the business of agriculture was brought to you by Nori. If you're feeling left out of carbon markets, Nori is a carbon removal marketplace that welcomes early adopters of regenerative farming. We work directly with farmers to enter their data and project their carbon credits, which the farmer owns and sets the price on. Nori is the marketplace, not the middleman, so farmers get paid directly once their credits are sold. We believe that carbon credits should be an asset the farmer controls, not the rights that they sell. To learn more on how you can enroll your farm, visit nori.com growers. And if you are a company looking to get involved with carbon markets, reach out to hello at nori.com. Nori, a carbon marketplace for early adopters. Visit nori.com slash growers.